Okay, let's hear from uh, let's hear from our audience. We'll start over here. Please give your name and then articulate a question. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, the other way around? <laughs> Jay Schweiker at Harvard Law School. Uh, my question is for Professor Rappaport, and I think it speaks to what Professor Rosen was saying about the concern with uh, faux judicial restraint. And that's the what is the role that incrementalism should play in principled. Uh, originalism in the face of perhaps uh, bad precedent. You mentioned the example of uh, the problem of enormous cost, that if we immediately gave effect to the original understanding of the Commerce Clause, or perhaps, say, the Privileges or Immunities Clause, that might sort of affect a revolution that would have huge costs. But if we did it incrementally, maybe that would be, those concerns would be mitigated. So to what role should, in, in what way should judges uh, think about proceeding incrementally while avoiding seeming like they're, uh, you know, mischaracterizing precedent or, you know, obfuscating what they're actually doing? Well, that's, that's a very good question um, because obviously incrementalism has certain advantages to it in terms of not having radical change. On the other hand, it seems to be conflicting to some extent with, with, with principled analysis. Um, look, the, the idea that I have is that we come up with a, a full sort of doctrine of, of precedent of, of four, five, six different precedent rules that, that, that operate. Now some of that, and, and I don't have one of them that is an incremental one that says, um, some of it works in indirectly. So I would not return all the way to the, to the uh, pre-New Deal Commerce Clause. Um, Right? I think that would be too radical a change, but that doesn't mean that um, you couldn't return to a, a more moderate one, which would, would uh, be closer to the original meaning and would avoid enormous costs. So there's a certain extent in which milder change are permitted under the rules that I would, would advocate, but not a strict incrementalism. Yes, over here now. Steve Calabresi, and uh, my question is for Professors Strauss and Rosen. Um, my question is, uh, we, we talked earlier about the difference between holding dicta and what could be called the zeitgeist associated with the precedent, and uh, an issue that is of current great inter interest to everyone is whether employer-mandated health insurance is within the scope of Congress's enumerated powers. Various New Deal precedents, such as Darby and Wickard versus Filburn, and uh, perhaps uh, Stewart Machine Company against Davis and others, have been referred to. But the holdings of those cases don't seem to have anything to do with requiring people to buy something. Uh, the holding in Wickard is about uh, forcing farmers not to grow something on their farm as elaborated in Raich. Uh, Stewart, Stewart Machine Company deals with a tax compelling saving for retirement. But no, there's no point at which in any of the prior Commerce Clause cases the court has actually held that Congress can compel uh, people to buy something. Do you think therefore that employer mandated health insurance should be evaluated by the Supreme Court without respect to precedent, uh, looking de novo at the constitutional text? Or do you read those New Deal precedents not as holdings and not simply for the dicta in them, but as a kind of zeitgeist for the whole period in which they happened? Um, well, I, I haven't looked at the issue, uh, Steve, enough to you know, write a brief on it, but here's my sort of horseback reaction. Um, uh, I, I don't think, I think if you, if you want to follow precedent faithfully, you don't have to find that Congress used this exact device in a previous case in implementing its commerce power. You just have to find that it's within the commerce power as defined in those New Deal cases and, uh, and sort of borrowing Marshall's formulation in McCulloch against Maryland. So for example, in South Carolina against Katzenbach, which is a 15th Amendment case, of course, where the court upheld the Voting Rights Act and the preclearance requirements, which whatever one might think about them uh, now, the, the, current, even the current court, even with its skepticism about those requirements now, uh, I take it to have conceded they were constitutional when they were enacted in 1965 in order to get at the problem of covert racial discrimination. There was nothing like that that had been done uh, before, nothing like requiring uh, state and local governments to pre-clear every change in their laws. And that's at least as dramatic an intrusion on, uh, in that case, state and local prerogatives as an employer mandate 
uh, or a, a mandate, a health care mandate would be on people's uh, autonomy. Um, that didn't hold up the court because it was within the scope of the uh, power. So that's my, that's my horseback reaction, that it would be a faithful application of precedent. Professor Rappaport? Or was it Professor Rosen? It was Rosen. Uh, Steve, it's a fascinating uh, suggestion, but if this court were to strike down the health care mandate in the uh, increasingly unlikely event that it passed by distinguishing between holding dic dicta and zeitgeist, there would be a national reaction that made the uh, reaction to the New Deal look tame. I mean, this sort of clever parsing, this is what infuriated Roberts's opponents in Parents United, and it, it would uh, be doubly so in a case like this. You forget that the baseline is restraint. The baseline, conservatives are supposed to be instinctively deferential and restrained and to have a presumption of upholding. And then you actually look at the originalist history, and as Professor McConnell has reminded us so extensively, the framers of the 14th Amendment expected Congress to be the primary definer of uh, rights affecting equality, which this health care mandate absolutely would, in addition to affecting interstate commerce, not judges. So this would this would just be New Dealism on steroids, and it would be the dishonesty of it. Not the dis I, forgive me, I, I would throw the word dishonesty, but it would be the kind of legalistic cleverness of it that would infuriate opponents so much that if this court were to strike down the mandate, and I won't uh, presume to speculate, better to do it openly, honestly, to say we're overturning Wickard, which of course Scalia and the others refused to do, and, and, and really return to that uh, pre-New Deal uh, understanding that Justice Thomas has embraced and no one else has, but don't pretend that you're doing it on the basis of parsing precedents. But why does a precedent about growing things on a farm or on your windowsill apply to requiring you to buy health insurance? I mean, why isn't, why isn't that the dicta in the opinions rather than the holding of the cases? Again, I, would, I haven't done this as a brief either, and I'm happy to uh, uh, debate it later, but I, I would think the framers of the 14th Amendment would have said that uh, this would be a Section 5 power because of its deep and profound impacts on equality, something that they thought Congress had almost plenary power to define. Judge Sykes is going to accept everybody's briefs on the <laughs> subject. Over here. Hi, uh, Steve Sanders from uh, Tulane Law School. Question for uh, Professor Strauss. I was wondering uh, what Rehnquist uh, era precedents do you think liberals in the future might turn to originalism to try to sweep away? Oh, um, well, you might, for example, I mean, I'm just guessing, you might see a liberal try to justify Roe against Wade on the basis of the original understandings. I'm just guessing about that. Um, uh, as far as uh, precedents that would be swept away, I think well, a logical candidate actually would be the uh, a precedents governing affirmative action. I mean, there is a. I mean, I don't believe in originalism, uh, um, but you know, if you if you, I think if you were to accept originalist assumptions, uh, it is really hard to see why the court can strike down affirmative action. Now, I mean, I actually think originalism is, is manipulable enough so that someone could say, well, yes, back then they thought it was okay to favor. Uh, minority groups or African Americans or newly freed slaves, but gee, look at today. Today, minorities are in an entirely different situation. You know, I think that shows you the manipulability of originalism. Um, but uh, if you were to say, you know, what was the original understanding about the scope of certainly Congress's power and, and even the state's power to favor uh, racial minorities, uh, it's, a, it's a tough row for originalists to, uh, uh, to, to hoe. Um, and I also, it's possible that uh, something like Citizens United, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a, the debate about that. Um, some of the religion cases, I, I think there might be fertile grounds for that. But I, I just, I mean, it, it makes me, I, I, don't, I don't think those are the terms in which the debate should be conducted. Um, uh, and I think it, I mean, this is just echoing what, what Jeff Rosen said. I think it is, it is more important to be upfront and candid about it. Um, and let me just say, I mean, in connection with Roe against Wade in particular, not a possible liberal uh, effort to overturn Roe against Wade, but a, a lot, this is a point I've heard Tom Merrill make, uh, I think a lot of conservative hostility to precedent comes about because of Roe against Wade is defended on the ground that it's a precedent. Um, and I think it is, you know, whatever we think about Roe against Wade, and I, I don't, I mean, we, we may disagree about that. You know, if you don't like Roe against Wade, there are good reasons not to like Roe against Wade. I happen not to share that view, but there are good reasons. But then, for heaven's sake, say, here's why I hate Roe against Wade. Don't say, here's why I hate precedent. 